Welcome to the full year results presentation. This is for the year ending May 2021. I'm joined this morning by Chris Belsham, our Group Finance Director. I'm going to take you through the operating highlights in the year. Chris is then going to come back in and take us through a financial review. And then I'm going to come back and talk about the exciting growth strategy that we have and the business outlook. For those unfamiliar with NWF or joining us for the first time, NWF is a specialist distributor of fuel, food and feed across the UK. We've got a strong track record of delivering increased shareholder returns. In point of fact, if you compare us to the FTSE 100 as an index, we've outperformed the FTSE 100 in terms of total shareholder return over the last three years, five years, and 10 years. So it's an impressive track record. We operate in large stable markets, and we generate cash and have a progressive dividend. And we'll be taking through our clear growth strategy later. In fuels, we're supplying fuel to commercial and domestic customers across the UK, with a third largest distributor in the UK, and supply just under 700 million litres of fuel each year. In food, we're the leading consolidator of ambient grocery in the northwest of England. And we have over a million square foot of modern racked warehouses to store our customers' products. And in feeds, we're providing nutrition advice and animal feed to ruminant farmers up and down the UK. The easiest way to remember us is we feed one in six dairy cows in Great Britain. I now move on to the financial results in summary. It's a strong set of results we're presenting today ahead of the pre-pandemic market expectations. Revenue, 676 million, a little lower than last year, but that's because of the lower average oil price. We've actually had increased activity in our fuel and food businesses. The key number I always focus on is the headline profit for tax. That's 11.9 million. That's the second highest that the group's delivered. And in fact, it's 23% higher than the pre-pandemic year of 2019, slightly lower than the prior year when we had significant gains from a fall in the oil price that happened. Equally as important as profit is cash. I'm pleased to report net debt is lower than expectations at 5.7 million. And that represents only 0.3 times EBITDA, so a very comfortable level of net debt. Finally, the dividend. Um, it's actually 10 straight years where we've increased the dividend as a group. And that really reflects the good underlying growth of the group between 4 and 5%. So the total dividend for the year is 7.2 pence, up 4.3% on prior year. Then move on to the divisions and start with fuels. Here we've had good outperformance. We've traded ahead of expectations, supported by our commercial strategy to focus on gas oil, also known as red diesel, a cold winter, and also extended home working. And we've delivered 695 million liters, up just under 5% in the year. We've managed volatile and generally increasing oil prices. It started the year at $38 a barrel, that's Brent crude, ended the year at $70 per barrel, and today, this morning, was $74 a barrel. So that's slowly increased over the period, so it hasn't been beneficial. Also announcing that we launched a priority club, the NWF Priority Club for domestic and commercial customers. And if you look at the picture on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, that's actually a screenshot of my phone and the app that's on there. And what that does is it monitors the amount of oil in the tank that I have each day, and also my usage by day, by week, by month. And customers who are in the Priority Club, as well as having the app, are on auto top-up, so they never need to worry about running out. As soon as we see that the level has dropped below 35%, we will put on an order for delivery and do it in the most um, effective way utilizing our logistics network. And customers will just pay by direct debit. So it makes it very simple. You never run out. And we've now got over 2,000 domestic customers in our priority club and also have a number of commercial customers. On acquisitions, we've got a good pipeline building. And Chris will take us through more of that later. Then move on to food. And here we've had very successful investment. The picture on the right hand side was taken about a month ago of our crew facility. This is a 240,000 square foot warehouse with 35,000 pallet spaces. So it increases our total capacity now to 135,000. It's full in crew, it's operating efficiently, and it's a great sort of benchmark that we can measure our performance against. Our business has grown as a consequence, so the revenue is up 13%, pallet stored up 16%, and outloads up 13%. It's very much been a year of two halves. In the first half of the year, we had a, 
a challenging conditions because we had lots of volatility. We had retailers stocking up in case of uh, lockdowns that were happening, retailers stocking up and then destocking because of concerns around Brexit and then restocking again. So what that created for us in distribution was a lot of volatility and therefore inefficient working. In the second half, performance has improved significantly. We've significantly outperformed the prior year where we've managed good customer demand, good levels of storage, good levels of distribution, and critically done it efficiently. We've also increased our e-fulfillment, pallet line, and packing room operations. And there's a lot of stories in the news about HGV drivers. And, and positively at NWF, we took the decision just over a year ago to reduce our reliance on agency drivers and recruit our own. So we actually recruited in food over 70 new drivers who joined the group. Um, it is still a challenging market, and we have recently implemented a further uh, salary increase to our HGV drivers, but that has been passed on successfully in further price increases to customers. And thirdly, in this section, in feeds, very much we're focusing on the future. We focus on nutrition advice to dairy farmers in particular. And the picture on the right-hand side is a group in our academy. We've continued to train our academy members through the year, although we went virtual for part of the year. We're now back to physical tuition. And we're looking to recruit additional members to the academy um, in the cohort starting in this autumn. We've actually sold a greater proportion of our volume direct to farmers. You can see our overall volumes were down 8%, but that volume reduction is principally around lower volumes to other compounders and merchants. What we've all seen in the year is an unprecedented increase in commodity prices. Um, I track a typical basket of commodities in a dairy diet, and the pricing of those commodities have increased by 40% during the year. Uh, we found that quite challenging because it also happened sort of October, November when we had our cyber incident. So uh, that was quite challenging. We've now recovered, we've got the pricing moved through, and margins have been restored to our normal levels. It's actually quite a positive market out there because the milk price has improved to over 30 pence per litre. Milk production is stable, up 0.1%, and the overall ruminant market is up 5%, although that's principally grown through beef and sheep growth. If you look at dairy compound sales, they're a little lower than they were in the prior year. And just before I hand over to Chris, just to point out that's another picture that we took a month ago of our crew facility. And you've got Adam there loading some more flake product that's going off to Tesco. So it's a great facility and working really well. But uh, now for the financial review, over to you, Chris. Thanks, Richard. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, we'll kick off with the income statement. Um, so you can see that revenue decreased in the year by just under 12 million. And that's really a result of a lower average oil price across the year, which offset increases in activity and increases on, on prices in other areas. So a slight reduction in revenue. Uh, that's fallen through to a headline operating profit of 12.9 million, 1.4 million lower than the prior year, but again driven by the performance in fuels. And if you look at the table at the bottom of the page, as you know, we typically say we're aiming to uh, achieve an operating profit of a penny per liter in our fuels business. Last year, with the exceptional conditions we had in March and April, we achieved 1.6 pence. This year, with the very strong demand through the winter, with the cold weather and working from home, we achieved 1.4 pence. So still well above our normal target of a penny. The other thing to pull out on this page is the exceptional costs. So as we reported at the half year, we'd had a cyber incident in the first half. Um, as a result of that, we've had exceptional costs of 0.3 million net of insurance recoveries. And we've also had some acquisition related costs. Uh, we didn't actually do a transaction in the year, but unfortunately we had one that uh, fell over at the, at the end of the, the process and some costs related to that. And we also hived up some um, acquisitions from previous years. We then move on to the bottom half of the income statement, headline PBT of 11.9 million. Our financing costs are a little bit lower, largely due to lower net debt and a lower pension deficit across the year. And it's probably also worth just pulling out the tax rate, which um, is very high with an effective tax rate of 28.3%. But that's a result of a one-off uh, impact of the increase in corporation tax, which meant we had to um, recalculate our deferred tax liability. Um, so there's a 1.3 million non-cash charge in there. 
our real underlying tax rate was 19.4%. And typically we'd guide at being one to one and a half percent above statutory rate. That results in a diluted headline EPS of 20.4 pence versus 21.3 for the prior year. And as Richard said, that's resulting in us proposing a final dividend um, up 4.3% of 7.2p. Uh, Moving on to the balance sheet, and we've seen an increase in balance sheet strength again in the year, but that's really due to the reduction in net debt and the pension deficit. In terms of fixed assets, they've reduced slightly, um, and that's because our capex was a little bit lower than depreciation and probably reflects the fact that we were all working from home and therefore spending a little bit less money on the site. Um, I'd expect in the current year that capex will go back towards um, depreciation levels, so it'd be about a million pounds higher than it was in FY21. Our working capital is a little bit lower, but I think that's a short term impact. So the year end actually fell on a bank holiday and therefore some of our suppliers took payment after the bank holiday. So we, we made a short term gain, but that's effectively already reversed. Having said that, our underlying working capital has been very well controlled across the year and our cash collection has been very strong. So we haven't seen delinquency in our, on our customers uh, payments. In terms of return on capital employed, uh, group return on capital employed of 15.8%, which is uh, again driven by very strong returns in fuels. It's good to see food increasing in the second half of the year, and the run rate there is probably more like 8 to 9%. And then in feeds, clearly that's lower than we'd like to see it, and we'd expect to see recovery in, in the current year. In terms of the pension deficit, that's reduced in the year down to 14.9 million, and that's almost all a result of asset gains and the contributions we made in the year. So whilst there have been changes in the liability assumptions, they've sort of balanced each other out. The triennial valuation was concluded in the first half and that uh, resulted in a liability of 16.8 million. And in terms of our recovery plan payments, they'll be 1.8 million until May 22, and then 2.1 million thereafter although there is a dividend growth link in there. So dividend growth above the May 19 dividend um, will increase those payments. So actually, as it stands, uh, those payments will be about 9% higher from January 22 onwards. At that level, uh, given our cash generation and facilities, it's not causing any issues in, in terms of having funds available to spend on group development. And you can see that as we Look at the cash flow, it's a very strong cash generation in the year uh, with cash conversion of 107.8%. And because we haven't done an acquisition in the year, that's resulted in net debt reducing down to 5.7 million. And you can see that best if you look at the chart on the right hand side here. So our free cash flow in the year was 8.3 million. Um, if you normalize that for the working capital gain we had, and for the fact that we underspent on capital expenditure by about a million pounds, we still had free cash flow of about five million. And normally we'd guide towards free cash flow of about three to four million. So very strong cash performance in the year. In terms of our facilities, we continue to have 65 million available with NatWest, and that runs until October 2023. The bulk of that facility is still in the form of an invoice discounting line of 50 million. Uh, which is very low cost. We pay 1.25% over base for that facility. And given the higher oil price, uh, we now have that facility is largely available to us. So significant headroom in there. As a board, we're comfortable up to about two times net debt to EBITDA. So again, plenty of headroom above our current level of 0.3. So in summary, very strong set of results again this year, which leaves the the group with a strong balance sheet and plenty of funding headroom for our future development, at which point I will hand back to Richard. Okay, thanks, Chris. So what I now want to do is take us through uh, our exciting growth plans. So in terms of our strategy, just remember in summary, a few key things about NWF. First of all, we have a diverse source of earnings. So we've got three divisions operating in three markets. And therefore what you can see over a three, five or 10 year period is really solid, steady growth. And that gives us a good solid underpin, but we're also ambitious to move further and faster. 
We generate cash, as Chris has just taken us through, and we have an experienced and capable board. We focus on shareholder return, and we also pay a good dividend and have a good track record. In terms of the divisions on fuels, I've got a few more slides to go into this detail, but our strategy here is to consolidate a highly fragmented market. In food, it's about optimizing the customer mix, finding customers who will utilize our added value propositions of e-fulfillment, packing room, and pallet line, but also continuing to work with customers to target contracts which enable the business to expand. The crew expansion of 35,000 pallet spaces this year came about through working with customers who wanted to go into long-term contracts which backed our growth plans. And in feeds, we've got opportunities to further consolidate the market. Remember, we're number two in the ruminant feed market. And we've also got the opportunity to utilize our excellent operations platform. We've got great facilities up in the north of England, here in Cheshire, and down in Devon, and we can utilize that facility. And what we're doing is training additional nutritionists through our academy to utilize that strength. We're also working with over 4,500 farmers up, the, up and down the country, and therefore providing additional products and services to them is always important. So now I move on to a bit more focus on fuel. First of all, the fuel market. Um, it's a very fragmented market. If you look at the pie chart on the right-hand side, you can see the top 10 players, which we've named, including ourselves, represent just under 25% of the market. So more than 75% of the market is represented by over 150 smaller players. So it's very fragmented. We're number three with just over 2% market share. And the market hasn't really changed in the last 12 months. It's been stable. Everyone's been performing pretty well. But the consolidation opportunity exists. In terms of the fuels market, the markets that we're serving are pretty resilient. Over 30% of our fuel is used in heating up applications, be it domestic or commercial. 12% is used in agriculture. And less than 5% actually goes to retail garages. Uh, and when we're selling diesel, it's predominantly for HGV and LGV users. We are looking at some future fuel types, and we're working actually on an exclusive basis with ESSO, looking at HVO30. This is a diesel containing 30% hydro-treated vegetable oil. So it's a non-fossil fuel, and in the case of the 30, it's used as a 30% additive, and therefore reducing emissions, um, and actually quite fuel efficient. So those are trials that we're doing across the country, and then on a more limited basis, we're doing trials with domestic customers on HVO 100. So that's 100% renewable um, oil, which is used to power oil boilers, which works with just a few minor adjustments. So those are trials that we're undertaking. The key that I point out is NWF has 90,000 domestic customers. And whatever fuel category is being used in the future, if it's a liquid fuel, NWF will be here to provide it. In terms of our customers, you need to remember that customers purchase fuel from local depots. And therefore, expanding the depot network is key to our growth. If you look at the acquisition activity since 2019, that's what we've shown on the map on the right hand side. Um, each of the white squares is a depot that's been added. Um, since that period, we've actually acquired five businesses, over 150 million litres of business has been added and spent over 14 million pounds. We've got a clear post-acquisition integration plan, and you can see our track record there at the bottom left-hand side of the slide, where 10 years ago we were doing about 350 million litres, now just under 700 million litres and accelerating. And in terms of the map, apologies to anyone in the north of Scotland, um, the area we're looking at is within Great Britain. Uh, we have been to Inverness in the last year or so, and we continue to look at opportunities. So, Chris, you'll give us a bit of background on the activity that we're doing there. Uh, yes, thanks, Richard. So, um, it, it's important, I think, in, in looking at the buy and build process that we're pursuing to recognize that we need to combine a, a very efficient, repeatable process but to recognize that we're buying mom and pop type businesses where a personal element's really important. And I think COVID lockdowns have, have shown how difficult that personal bit was when you can't actually go and, and meet people. So we have found it's taken a little bit longer to build back the pipeline um, over the last few months. But we have, um, now that things have eased up a bit, we have been uh, very successful in, in going out meeting businesses proactively again and building back up the pipeline so there are a number of opportunities there and, and active discussions are ongoing uh, i have talked through our process uh, with you before but just to recap 
We have a very standard valuation and pricing process. And as a reminder, we're looking to pay six times EBIT for businesses. That's six times the EBIT that NWF expects to make. But we don't build any significant synergies into that valuation process. Then once we're in process, we uh, work with the same advisors. We have standard documentation. We're aware of the type of issues that exist on these businesses and our advisors understand what our approach to those are. So uh, that's a very efficient process that we work through. And then once we've bought the business, we have an integration process that we go through. And the aim of that, as Richard's touched on, is to leave the front end, the customer facing element in place, because that's the valuable bit that we bought but to centralize all the back office functions. So we put it onto our systems, we put our compliance measures in, um, and therefore have the efficiency and control over the business. So as I've said, we've got a, a strong pipeline again, uh, and we're therefore looking to deploy about 10 million pounds per annum on our acquisition strategy. Okay, thanks, Chris. Just move on now to cover our ESG framework. And in terms of this for governance, NWF has adopted the QCA 10-point guide, which the board regularly reviews and updates. In terms of our ESG framework, you can find more details on this on our website, or in fact, on our annual report. What we have are four pillars in our framework, safety, people, partnerships, and the environment. If I take each of these in turn and give you a little bit more detail. In terms of creating a culture of safety, as a specialist distributor, clearly we're on the road a lot using lots of vehicles and therefore safety on the road is critical. We've actually in the year installed 360 degree cameras into all of our food and feeds vehicles. And in addition, all 123 fuel tanker drivers have been through an externally accredited uh, course and have passed. For people, obviously this has been a critical year as the pandemic has carried on and we've carried on with home working and safe working. We've got HR business partners in each of our divisions working with our employees and doing pulse surveys to understand where people are and how we can best support them. At the same time, we've actually got 17 apprentices and graduate placements in the group. And as I said earlier, we're continuing to expand the academy in our feeds division. In terms of partnerships, a good example is probably in fuels, where when the pandemic struck, a number of our fuels customers asked for extended credit, which we supported them with. And at the same way, our suppliers, major fuel companies, also supported us with additional credit. So very much working through the supply chain. In our feeds division, working with universities and other nutritionists, we've come up with diets which utilize zero soya and zero palm kernel, but still provide the same nutritional benefits to farmers. And in terms of the environment, as you can imagine, again, with vehicles, the focus is very much on fuel efficiency and emission reduction. And that's why we have a policy at NWF of replacing all our vehicles after five years to make sure we have the very latest truck or tanker to deliver fuel efficiently with a minimum of emissions. We've also, in food, been trialing um, a gas-powered truck, which has actually been quite efficient in the year, and we may look to roll that out further. A couple of more slides, just the NWF proposition, so why pick us? So we've got a strong management team. And as well as at the group, what we've got are people in each of the divisions who've got really deep-seated experience of each of the businesses in which they work. So whether it's working with major food manufacturers and the supermarkets, working with dairy farmers um, up and down the country, or supplying fuel in all sorts of weather conditions and with high and low prices of oil, we've got people who spent their entire careers in those businesses learning how to work with them and to optimize them. And we've complemented that with additional hires into those businesses and promotions to support the development of each group. We've got a very clear growth strategy, which hopefully I've outlined today. And we've also got asset backing. The gross assets of the group are 187 million. So that helps Chris and I sleep at night, but it also gives us a very cost-effective source of funding. We focus on capital return. You can see our capital return in the year is 15.8%. And we also consistently generate cash over 100% in the last 12 months. One of the results of that is we're able to pay an increasing dividend. 7.2 pence is the total dividend this year, 10 years of straight dividend growth from NWF. So the final slide is at NWF, we've got a significant opportunity for growth. Very pleased with a strong set of results in 2021. Critically, they outperformed pre-pandemic market expectations. And we're now two months into our new financial year. 
so pleased to announce that we're currently trading in line with the board's expectations. In fuels, Chris is being very busy targeting additional fuel acquisitions. In food, we're efficiently meeting customers' needs to deliver good service in spite of some variable demand levels. And in feeds, we're managing farmers' nutrition during the quieter summer months. We thought we we're gonna have a dry summer, now we might have a wet summer, but we'll manage nutrition come what may. And so finally, pleased to report we've got confidence in the future development opportunities and the outlook for the group. So that finishes the presentation. I'm now happy to pass it over to a Q&A session. And we have a question from Andrew Ford at Peel Hunt. Well, well done on a positive set of results. On food, um, you mentioned um, that you were slightly ahead of optimum utilisation. Um, if, if you were to achieve sort of a, a better um, utilisation rate, what, what would be the expected margin improvement um, in that division? Um, how would that yeah, how would that help there? Um, on on fuels, the increase price per litre in um, uh, in twenty one, uh, sort of, it's partly down to volatility, partly down to an increase in uh, home use. Uh, I wondered if you could give uh, a bit of an indication as to the split between between the two. So how, how much is um, that sort of increased home consumption helping? Um, and lastly, on feeds, what uh, what are the sort of the factors that are giving you confidence in in the sort of feed ingredient cost stabilizing uh, over the next uh, over the next six months? Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, I'll work my way through those and shout if I, I get one of them wrong. Um, in terms of food, um, whilst I mentioned we're slightly ahead of optimized position at the moment, that's that's very much short term. So we've got a one hundred thirty two thousand pallets stored today. Um, we've only got one hundred thirty five thousand slots. So realistically being 132 is a bit full. The reason we're a bit full today um, is short term. It's frankly, we've got enough drivers, but I think the supermarkets have got issues with isolations in their distribution centers and also in the supermarkets. So we'd expect that to recover shortly or our manufacturers will reduce the amount of product that they ship into us. Um, so I'm not expecting any margin improvement from that. The key in food is actually being full and efficient, but not too full and not being too greedy with bringing in extra customers. For the margins that we've got at the moment, I'd see the second half margins as being sustainable and consistent, which, which is positive. Um, in fuel, on pence per litre, um, Chris sort of highlighted 1.4 is higher than we'd normally expect. So a penny a litre is what we would uh, normally guide as being our, our, our normal sort of business. In terms of um, domestic usage, it was higher this year. But frankly, it's difficult for me to understand how much of that was from usage because of home working or because it was cold. Um, we're getting good data from our priority club so we can see usage there. We can see very high usage in January, but frankly, it was very cold in January and that then then reduced. So it was the combination of both which which really gave us gave us the benefit. But I think going back to a penny a litre is a, is a reasonable assumption going forward. Um, and thirdly, if I got it right on feeds, um, commodities will always move. Uh, we don't have a view on commodity prices. Um, positively, where we are today, uh, pricing is aligned to those commodity prices. Um, and I think if it was to change further, we will change prices again, be it up or down. I think the issue that we had um, in the last 12 months is, is that price accelerated midwinter, which is always hard to change prices. And just for us, it happened when we had our cyber incident. So, reduce our visibility. But I'm confident with the actions that we're taking, whether frankly the price of commodities stabilizes or goes up or down, um, we should still have a good business performance. Just can you give us, um, either Chris or Richard, a bit of uh, an update on the acquisition environment? Obviously the sort of gradual um, increase in fuel prices was, was a, a slight challenge for you. I wonder how that's affected some of the smaller players and if that's um, opened up any opportunities or, or just uh, just in general, you know, um, unlocking of lockdowns, etc. is how that's changed the landscape. Yeah, so the reality is everybody in the fuel sector who's servicing domestic customers has had a, a good COVID period. Um, so they've done well through that. Um, but it doesn't really change the dynamics of what's driving M&A activity. So um, you have a, a lot of businesses who have owners who are past or close to retirement age. So what's really driving their desire to exit is the desire to retire. Um, the fact that they've had a good year or two because of home working um, just means they're quite 
happy that they've had a good year or two. Um, so on the whole, it's not really changed the, the, the dynamic. Positively, it also hasn't changed multiple aspirations. Uh, we are the most active um, person actually in the M&A market for these type of businesses. So we are sort of setting the pricing agenda really. Um, so we're not seeing huge competition for assets. Um, and most of our pipeline comes from proactively going out and, and meeting businesses. So they tend to be off market conversations as well. Um, the one challenge, I guess, from a valuation perspective is that they've had a good couple of years and are they expecting to be valued off that higher profit level? Um, and certainly when we're doing the valuation valuation exercise, we're, we are normalizing out what we perceive to be the, the COVID boost that they've, they've had in their numbers. So that makes that conversation a little bit more difficult. Um, however, it's a sector that generally accepts you have up years and you have down years. So it's an easier conversation than it would be to have with, with other sectors. And we've got a question from Adrian Kearsley from Panama Gordon, who asks, last year CapEx was behind its normal run rate. Will CapEx need to be higher than normal in the current year or have projects simply been moved out to the left? Uh, thanks, Adrian. Um, I, I'd anticipate it would be just that normal level, so sort of a million pounds higher than the, the 2.9 we spent in FY21. Um, round the edges, there might be a little bit of catch up, um, but I wouldn't expect that to be significant or material. And we have a question from Gavin Laidlaw from Stockwatch, who asks, is the property valuation up to date? And also, could you talk about the warehouse future? In terms of the valuation, um, our main property asset is the site at Wardle, which is on our books for sort of low 20s. Um, we do disclose in the report and accounts its open market value, and, and the latest valuation on that was about 40 million, uh, albeit that's up quite significant from la last year's report and accounts, which was sort of in the low 30s. Maybe just to comment on warehouses, um, warehouses today are in short supply. Um, so developers are, are building some more speculatively. Uh, we're fully utilizing our warehouses. And as I said earlier, if we get new contracts, we could look to expand. Um, but that would probably be through uh, some new build that somebody's going to put up um, on our behalf. We're, we're not looking to buy land or build warehouses. And we'll go back to Andrew Ford at Peel Hunt. I just I wondered on, on uh, sort of the food side, uh, where do you, would you like to see, for a better term, sort of the customer mix ending up between the ill fulfillment, like the e fulfillment side, um, and the more pallet side? Is it that you're looking to shift some capacity across, or would it be accretive, sort of um, you know, you're looking, you know, building out the capacity to fulfill the e fulfillment, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, I, I get that. I think um, at our core, we're an ambient grocery consolidator. So it's taking pallets of, of customers' products and putting it together with other customers' products to be the lowest cost, most environmentally friendly way of distributing groceries across the UK. That's our core business. Um, most customers also have some e-fulfillment work, some packing room work, and some pallet line work. So therefore, the more additional business we can pick up, the better revenue we can make, the better return we can make from each customer that we bring in. Um, I don't see us as being a sort of standalone e-fulfillment operation. Um, I see it very much as being a complement to our ambient grocery consolidation and an added value extra service. And clearly, it can give you a much higher return on capital, which we like. And a key to the food business, I think it was on the slide, is all about what I call optimization. So you know, we could have someone who ships full loads um, direct to three supermarkets and has no added value work. Um, their margins will be lower than someone who has lots of complexity to their distribution and also lots of added value work. So very much those areas are complementary, um, not really standalone, but um, they've grown well. And that's the end of questions. Richard, do you have any closing remarks? No, no further closing remarks other than to thank everyone for attending. Um, really pleased that we've been able to present another strong set of results, building on our successful track record. And also, hopefully, we've been able to outline to you the strong platform for growth and how we're looking to move the group forward over the coming years. So thank you very much. Thank you.